Y'all can turn over, ooh, wow. Turn over to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. We're going to be looking uh, at a good portion of the psalm uh, as we continue our series of lessons uh, on entering into the presence of God. And uh, specifically, uh, in this segment, the final segment uh, of our consideration, uh, we're talking about worship. Uh, And we started last week to consider some of the acts uh, of worship, notably uh, singing. Uh, or song. Uh, And of course, uh, we want to do a couple of lessons on singing and song because it indeed is one of those powerful things that connects uh, Christians in this very profitable, this very beneficial, this very powerful uh, way. So we kind of introduced that last week. But you know, in the course of the week, um, and and if you've ever written anything, you you know what I mean when when I say that Sometimes you, you get halfway into a study or a quarter of the way into the study. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's even three quarters of the way into the study for a particular topic. And, and you realize that, you know what, I, I should take a step back and, and actually go a different direction for a little bit uh, and then come back to this because it would make more sense. Before we talk any more really about the acts of worship, and then there's another A that is associated with the idea of worship that I want us to focus on just for this week before we pick up next week uh, with our discussion of the different acts uh, of worship and what they mean and how they manifest themselves and, and what they should mean to us and uh, how we, you know, perform them, uh, how we uh, show them in the presence uh, of God. Uh, And to kind of demonstrate this, it kind of reminded me when I thought about the different things that are associated with the point that we want to talk about tonight. Uh, I thought about uh, when I was a kid. We like to play baseball. One of our favorite games to play was a game called Rundown. And if you play baseball, you probably know what this is. You probably, you may have had a different name for it, but you basically have two bases. Two guys stand on the bases, and there's a guy in the middle, and he has to run and try to get on one of the bases before he's tagged out. And we played that game for hours, for hours and hours and hours. But, you know, there was always that time when you didn't always have the friends from the neighborhood there. Uh, Brothers and cousins and all of those folks, you know, sometimes they weren't there. So I would spend sometimes in the backyard, you know, just simply throwing the ball uh, up in the air and catching it. I don't know, maybe... Guys, girls, you might not connect with that too much, but, you know, throwing a ball in the air and see how high you can get it and see if you can catch it, that that, that was a fun thing. If we uh, really got into it, we would take a bat with us. We would throw the ball up into the air, and then we would see if we could hit kind of our own pitch. It reminded me of this story of this little boy who was in his backyard, and he was doing that very thing. Threw the ball up in the air and, you know, uh, would take a swing at it. Take a swing at it. Well, before he even started, he, he, he cries out to the world, I'm the greatest hitter there ever was. Greatest hitter there ever was. And he throws the ball up into the air as high as it can go, and he watches the ball come down, waits until it's right about there, and swings and misses the ball. Boom. Hits the ground, and he's not daunting. He bends down, he picks the ball up, and he stands up, and he says to the world, I'm the greatest hitter there ever was. And he throws the ball up in the air, and he waits for it to come down right in there, and he swings and he misses again. And he pauses for a moment longer than he did the first time, but yet again he bends down, he picks up the ball. A little slower this time, but he announces to the world that he is the greatest hitter that there ever was. And one last time, at the end of the sigh, he throws the ball up into the air, he waits for the ball to come down, he swings and he misses again. And the ball hits the ground, and his bottom hits the ground, and he, and he stays there. And mom, watching all of this out the window, decides, I better go out, and I, I better talk to him. So she heads out the door, and she starts towards her son. She gets within 10 feet. The son pops up out of his seated position, turns around to run, and is surprised to see mom there. And yet he can't stop himself. Mom, mom, you're not going to believe it. And mom says, what? Surprised that he was so bubbly and kind of excited about it. He says, I just struck out the greatest hitter in the world. I must be the greatest pitcher in the world. You probably heard that story, right? Attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. There's a guy by the name of Chuck Swindoll. I don't agree with everything Chuck Swindoll believes in, but Chuck Swindoll wrote a couple books. And I like uh, to read his books from time to time. And in one of his books, he wrote this. He said, words can never adequately convey. 
can never adequately, adequately convey the incredible impact of our attitude toward life. The longer I live, the more convinced I become that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we respond to it. Attitude is everything. You know, before we ever hope to get the acts of worship right, we've got to have the attitude of worship correct. See, because I can walk into a, a building on any given Sunday or any given Wednesday or I'm with my family in my home or, or wherever it is, wherever I am when I engage in worship. And if I don't have the proper attitude, I can do all the acts appropriately and as much as I want to, and it's just simply not going to matter. Attitude is vitally important, and that brings us to Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is a psalm that is written by David. It's written by David, and it begins by David expressing his confidence in God. In some bold declarations, in verses 1 through 3, David says, The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me, <clears throat> assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. David here throws out these bold declarations, bold declarations of faith. Even though he's attacked by his enemies, even though all of these things are going on around him, even though David is in probably the hardest pressed situation among his people. I mean, he's king, right? I mean, how many of us want to be king? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just can't imagine that job. It's a big, big job. The, the leader of your, your people, not only in, in a, not only in a uh, kind of a civil sort of social type of way, but he's the leader of God's people. So you have that added kind of theocratic sort of element to the society here. Not only do you have to do that which is right for your people, but you have to do that which is right in, both, in, in God's eyes. So you're getting it kind of, the, you know, uh, you're getting a lot of pressure. So David is the king of Israel. He's the leader of the armies. Uh, and he is a student and teacher of God's word. Here's a guy that has a lot of pressure. Here's a guy who has a lot of, uh, of struggles and a lot of things placed upon his shoulders. And yet he boldly proclaims his faith in God. Well, it makes sense because God has done all of these things for him. God has richly blessed him. God is certainly worthy uh, of his praise. And I think most of us acknowledge that. I mean, most of us acknowledge that, you know, God is worthy of our praise. Even though there are times when we don't necessarily feel like worshiping. We don't necessarily have the, the attitude uh, of worship. I mean, have you ever, you ever gone to a worship service and, and just feel, man, I'm just really not into it? You know, my, I just don't, something's just not connecting with my heart. And that zeal is not there, and it feels sort of lifeless, and it feels kind of flat, you know, for us. Well, that all has to do with this whole attitude. So we have to ask, you know, how does David, uh, how does David, and we don't know that he didn't, and we don't know that he, you know, didn't have struggles, but how does David maintain that? How does anybody maintain that proper attitude towards, you know, worship to God? Well, I think David, in the next couple of verses, is going to mention four things. Four things that have to do with attitude that will help us maintain a proper perspective when it comes to attitude and how it impacts our worship. Let's read the next couple of verses. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around, and I will offer his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. 
So we go back and we look at the lesson that we had, you know, last week. David here is talking about giving God praise, giving God, you know, glory. And we do that not only in our worship services, but we do that with our daily living. How do we do that with zeal and the proper attitude? Number one, David says that you have to have discipline in your worship. Go back to verse four. One thing have I asked of the Lord. Now, does that passage remind you of a passage let me, let me begin it. This one thing I do. Anybody remember who said that? Yeah, Paul, Paul said that. Paul said that, and he, and he said, this one thing I do. You know, I lay aside, and I'm going to paraphrase here. I lay aside all the cares of the world. I lay aside the track record I have. I lay aside all of my credentials and my history and my upbringing and, and the fact that I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews and the Jew of Jews and the Pharisee trained at the feet of the best teachers. I lay all that aside so that I can focus on doing one thing, attaining to the glory that is God. This one thing I do. David, long, long before Paul ever wrote anything, wrote very similar words. When it came to this idea of worship, he says, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, dwelling in the house of the Lord, well, we'll look at that in just a little bit, but it has everything to do with the notion of worship here. But the one thing, discipline. Well, how much discipline does it take to to worship with a proper attitude? I would think it'd take a lot, right? I mean, think about it. There's a lot of things to distract us from it. There are a lot of things that draw us away from having that single-minded pursuit of an effective worship. You know, just think about the worship services that we had. They, you know, we don't even include what goes on in our daily living. But think about our worship services alone. How many things are there uh, that are here that are drawing our attention away from what it is that, you know, we're doing? Sometimes it's the slightest thing. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's the people sitting next to us. Sometimes it's our own kind of mental noise that we brought to the building when we walked through the door. But there are a lot of things that can distract us from our purpose, distract us from focusing on giving God the glory. I, when I think of that point, I always think of David again on the field of battle with Goliath there. Do you remember why they were on the field? I mean, why was he going up against Goliath? Well, because nobody else would, right? I mean, nobody else would go. Uh, and all of the rest of the men from, you know, Israel's army, they, they basically stood there and just kind of listened to the guy. But you remember David went because he was incensed. He was enraged because Goliath was out there on the field of battle belittling, blaspheming, God. And David is just, he turns around to the rest of the, to, the, to the army and to his brothers and he says, how come you guys haven't done something about this guy? Why can't you guys see it? Why hasn't someone gone out there, said, I come in the power of God and slay this guy? And the simple fact of the matter is, is that none of them had that kind of focus. None of them had that kind of focus on God enough to go onto that field with confidence. Now think about it for a minute. If you're standing in David's shoes and you're facing that giant Goliath and the strength that you have on that battlefield is determined by the strength and the energy that you put into the worship that you have, are you going to win that battle? Or are you going to lose that battle? I mean, how much effort, how much focus do we actually put on giving God praise? You know, even in even in uh, modern worship, there are times when it seems like, maybe not among us, but I've certainly been to places where it's been the case that it seems more about who we are rather than who God is. It seems like it's more about, you know, me making my request known to God rather than giving God glory. It's funny, one time when, when uh, 
my family, when I was younger, we, we were traveling. We went to a congregation in Hebron, Ohio. Hebron, Ohio, just outside of, uh, you know, Columbus, uh, Ohio. And we were uh, passing through the area, <clears throat> passing through the area. And we stopped and we worshiped with this congregation that we had been to before. Uh, and they had another visitor that was there. Uh, and uh, we just happened to know that individual. And um, so did the congregation, because we both kind of frequent in this congregation. Uh, and uh, they had asked him to, to lead a prayer. It was kind of the main prayer for the, you know, the worship service. And he got up and, and he led this prayer. Uh, and in this prayer, he said nothing about the sick people of the congregation. He said nothing about, you know, um, giving us courage or strengthening us or, uh, you know, may... Um, uh, you know, may we uh, be always about doing your... He didn't say anything about that. Matter of fact, he did not mention the people in the congregation at all. He started with, and, and I tell you what, as a kid, I was sitting in my seat and I, I was kind of laughing. I, I had to admit it. And, and to this day, I'm still kind of embarrassed about it. I sat there and I was just kind of chuckling because he started with the wind. He said... Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wind. And he went from the wind to the water, and from the water to, to the earth, and from the earth to the, to the sky, and he went from the sky to the streams, to the oceans. To the, and, and he went through, and he said this, like, I'm telling you, it had to be five-minute prayer. Just thanking God for all of these blessings and describing them in just these intimate details that you could just simply tell this fellow appreciated. It was kind of like what the psalmists do. Now, sometimes I think some folks in their modern day worship, really, it's, it's kind of more about them. You know, when we sing, eh, yeah, we're singing, but really, is it about how we sound? Is it about, you know, how we feel about it? Or is it about really giving God, you know, the praise? Yeah, we'll pray to him, but, you know, is it, is it really kind of a selfish thing? I mean, you know, God's going to give us what we want. You know, if we ask, you know, ask, seek, knock. That's what he says. When it comes to the notion of worship, we've got to remember that the main focus, the discipline of worship demands that we focus on glorifying God. Giving him the praise, giving him the honor. And you go back and you look at the story of, you know, David and Goliath. David was offended by the arrogance of Goliath, and, and it was unwilling to acknowledge, unwilling to acknowledge the words of Goliath when Goliath was putting down his God. He was willing to stand up for God, in other words. And I think our worship, in part, is, is that very thing. You know, disciplined enough to stand up and proclaim <clears throat> God's praises. Number two, the destination of worship. We have the discipline of worship. It takes discipline to focus on God and to glorify God and, and rather than, you know, us and our situation and, and how we feel about it. But there's a destination of, uh, of worship. He says that I shall dwell in the house of the Lord um, all the days of my life. Now, that's a phrase that's repeated throughout the Psalms. First inclination it, about, with this phrase is to think, well, you know, David, um, you know, he's probably talking about the tabernacle. You've got to remember, David's not, uh, you know, David isn't alive when the temple was built. The only thing they have in the days of David uh, are the tabernacle, which is that tent made of skins and poles and, you know, things of that nature. Uh, so David would be very familiar with that, but that's really not what David is talking about either. Well, maybe David is talking about, you know, heaven. Well... You might think so if it weren't for the phrase, all the days of my life. So what exactly is it that David is talking about here? Well, he's talking about a destination, but it's not a place that you travel to in some, very, in some physical way. It's rather an experience that you have. And that experience is defined or summed up by saying we have an intimate relationship with with God. Just for a moment, hold your place in Psalm 27 and go back to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, and notice the last verse of that psalm. <clears throat> it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, what's Psalm 23 about? 
Well, Psalm 23 is about all the blessings that, you know, God gives us during our journey here. The way he protects us, the way he comforts us, the way he, he brings us along and, and educates us, and all of the wonderful things that he does for us as our great shepherd that mean goodness and mercy for us all the days of our life. And we will have a relationship with God. That's basically what he's saying. We have this relationship with God. Now, worship is meant to bring us to the throne of God that we might grow in our understanding uh, of him. And you can't have a relationship without God or, with, or you can't have a relationship with, with anybody without knowing them. Right? But, you know, there is relationship. And you can learn and you can know people. And sometimes this is a little bit more, you know, obvious than than not. Uh, today we we went to the Home Depot. We were buying some uh, a few things, a few things there, and uh, we bought one of the things we bought was some mulch, some mulch. And we we pull up and we ask the guy a question. He's out there in the parking lot. He's selling mulch, and uh, I asked him about these pallets that that he had stacked up there. Uh, and uh, we got in this small conversation about them, uh, and he just kind of gave me this nod and said, "I'll hook you up." So we go in the store, we start shopping, and we come back out, and I pull the truck up, and I start throwing pallets in the back of the truck. And Carrie says, what are you doing? The guy didn't say you could have those, and I said, yeah, he did. I said, he gave me the guy nod. What's the guy nod? What do you mean the guy nod? I said, he gave me the nod and said he'd hook me up. That means I could have the pallets that I asked him about. Well, she didn't understand that. See, that's a guy thing, right? You know, there's a between you and God thing, too, I would hope, right? Just like there's a girl thing. I, you know, there are girl things I don't understand. Sometimes Bethany looks at me and she said, Dad, you just don't understand. I'm like, okay. I guess I just don't understand, right? Because uh, for some reason, that's not the, uh, one of the aspects of the relationship we have. But, you know, when it comes to God, do we have a God thing? I mean, are there things that you take to God that only God would understand about you? I mean, you go over to the, book of the, you go over to the New Testament, the book of Romans, and you read there in the book of Romans about how we were going to God with these things that are inside of us that we can't even express in words. They're, they're really nothing more than groanings. And we can't even get them out. And yet God still knows. He still understands. Do we have that God, us, thing, relationship going on? Or is the prayer life, is the praise life, is the worship life between you and God just kind of this sort of, you know, flat unzealous sort of undisciplined you know type of thing well i think if we remember it's a destination a destination a relationship destination relationship so to speak that there are certain things that are involved in that destination number one that <clears throat> we understand that god is the object god is the object of our worship okay Number two, I think that we have to remember that God is also not just the object, but God is the motivation of our worship. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 7, you remember there's a guy by the name of Cain, and he's uh, offering a sacrifice, offering a sacrifice to God. Now, sometimes we go back there and say, well, you know, Abel offered a, you know, a sacrifice of blood, and, and Cain, his wasn't. His was from the field, and, you know, God, that, that wasn't acceptable. Well, that's really not written anywhere. Uh, if we base the standard upon what would come later, uh, then it would have been perfectly natural for him to give an offering of the first fruits of the field because that's what they did under, you know, the, the law of Moses. Uh, so, you know, why would we assume, you know, anything, you know, different? Anything different? So, you know, why was it that Cain's wasn't acceptable? Well, I'm going to just generically kind of put it out there. Now I just can't move. I could stand in one place. All right. Um, you know, I submit to you that you know it's probably the attitude with which it was given. You know, his brother's giving this. He's been envious of his brother, uh, so that's going to affect his attitude that he has in the worship that he gives. You know, to God, to God. So his relationship is strained here. You know, with God. But if we remember that God is not only the object, God is also the motivation. For worship, not, not somebody else's sacrifice, not how we feel about it. 
but how God is going to feel about it. It is possible to engage in worship to God in a way that is not pleasing to God. We can do that. When, when our attitudes are off base, when we're driven by things that are inappropriate, then certainly, if our motivation is wrong, then our worship is going to be wrong. Go over to Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> and let's begin reading at about verse um, 5. He says, But you say, if anyone tells his father and his mother, what you, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. In other words, they cared more about, more about their own tradition. They cared more about, uh, if you go back and you read uh, the kind of the history of this, keeping their money in their own pockets rather than giving it to God. Then notice verse 7 and 8. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from, from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. God is our object and God is also or should also be our motivation for worship. Number three, the duration of worship. We have the discipline of worship. We have the destination, destination relationship uh, of worship. We have the duration of worship. Notice here he says, all the days of my life. How long are you going to worship, David? How long are you going to give God the praise, David? Well, I'm going to give it to him for the rest of my life. I'm going to give, him to him, give it to him all the days that I have left here. And go over to Psalm 34, just very quickly. Psalm 34. Notice verses um, 1 through 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Now, this is one of the psalms that we're studying on Sunday mornings in the adult class. But you'll notice here. How long? I will bless the Lord at all times. Praise shall continually be in my mouth. David provides this wonderful model of exactly how our praise should be framed, what it, what it should actually look like. He says, number one, we should worship God willingly. I will bless the Lord at all times. He says, number two, that we should worship God continually. You know, there's never an inappropriate time for us to worship. Never. I mean, is God ever going to say, well, you know, it was wrong for you to sing those songs of praise to me because it was a Saturday, you know, at two in the afternoon. God's never going to say that to you. And you go back and you look at the history of his people. Whether they were beside the, the, the edge of a sea or it was after some great victory or it was in some time of sorrow. It was common for God's people in, in those ancient times when David lived to just break out in worship to the God that had so richly blessed them. Then he says that they worship God personally. So they worship willingly, worship continually, worship personally, personally, and then they worship corporately. Notice verse 3. He says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. A lot we could kind of say about that point, but, you know, um, it should be a one to another sort of thing. That's why when we turn over to the New Testament, a lot that we're going to, to see there, especially when it comes to singing, is that it's a one to, an, one to, to another activity. Uh, you're singing to, to encourage me, and I'm singing to encourage you. And, you know, when it comes to prayer, you know, you're, you're lifting up God's name. And uh, <clears throat> you're lifting up God's name on behalf of the, the saints. And I'm lifting up God's name on, on your behalf, and, and so on and so forth. It becomes something that we do together. And then the final thing is the desire of worship. Going back to Psalm 27. Back to Psalm 27. Notice it says, To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to see, excuse me, and to seek him in his temple. 
David, David had two desires in worship, it seems, from these verses. Number one, number one, he wanted, excuse me, to see the beauty of the Lord. Now, the Hebrew literally says, to behold the beauty of God. And it was a saying, apparently, in those ancient times that meant that the object of one's affection or the object that is mentioned in the phrase is the thing that brought the author the greatest delight. The greatest delight. You know, we have phrases kind of like that. You know, when we want to really emphasize that, you know, something was special or something was unique or something really, really impacted us. Now it kind of changes from generation to, to generation. But there are sayings that we have that kind of indicate that, that it really impacted our lives and was really some special event. Well, that's what this phrase was. This is the way that phrase is kind of found in their language. One thing I've asked the Lord I will seek, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to fully take in and continually gaze upon God's glory. Number two is that he seek him in his temple. And the idea here is to actively and passionately pursue God that we might know him better and enjoy him more. Well, those are the two basic or fundamental points that David has here, but you'll notice both of them are just kind of full of this kind of passionate plea for the notion of worship. You know, the Psalms do this kind of all through them. I mean, you can't read the Psalms, and I know I kind of say that a lot, but you can't read the Psalms and walk away thinking, oh, these people really didn't care too much for worship, did they? And, you know, they, they didn't long, you know, for the presence of God. You would never think that after reading the Psalms. As a matter of fact, you get done reading the Psalms, and if you're reading it to kind of discern how they had their minds fixed in worship, I don't know about you, but I get done reading on some of the Psalms, and I think, man, how come I can't do it like that? Man, I... They're up here. I'm down here. And, uh, you know, their zeal is you know, far exceeding mine. It's just amazing and astounding, but you'll notice. To seek his beauty, to seek him in his temple. Psalm 42 and verse 1. Anybody know what it says? As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. It's a description of a person desiring to give God praise. And glorify him. It's an astounding thing. So how is our attitude? I mean, what is our attitude like? Are we kind of a, of a can-do sort of mentality when it comes to, to worshiping God? That every time we, we come into you know, his presence in a corporate way and gather together, that it's, it's going to be a zealous thing. It's going to be a, you know, how can we make it better? How can we, how can we move forward in this and, and get to know our God and relate to him? In even more ways. Or are we the kind of person who's, eh, you know, I really just didn't get much out of that. You know, I've always wondered not kind of about that. You ever meet anybody who says, well, you know, I just really didn't get much out of worship. Well, that's good. Because you weren't designed to get anything out of it. You were designed to put things into it. Because God is the center and he is the one we are glorifying and praising. And if we don't feel as if we have satisfied that, and if we certainly have not satisfied it with our attitude, then what have we done? So our attitude must be correct. But of course, that's true of our life as a whole. Our life as a whole must be one where our attitude is reflective of the hope and the love and the passion that God has placed within us, we being his children, those who are destined for eternal life. And man, if we can't be happy about that, what can we be happy about? So let's end tonight by asking that question. Are you a child of God? If not, why do you wait? Why not obey him tonight? Why not enter into the waters of baptism? Let him wash you clean. Rise from those waters so you can walk in newness of life. Or maybe you simply need to come back and once again walk in those paths that give us strength. That allow us to say, like David... The Lord is the light of my salvation. 
whom shall I feel? fear? If you are subject to the invitations, call this evening. Come as we stand and sing. And as we fall. 